Hi all, this is Mr. Yeager for Honors Chemistry and we are starting our unit on chemical reactions today. Uh, we're going to try to cover the signs of a chemical reaction and then get into balancing chemical reactions and why do we balance chemical reactions. So at this point so far, I mean we've done quite a bit. We have looked at compounds and obviously that was our last unit on compounds and how they form. So now we're looking at obviously how they interact, getting really into the chemistry part of it of the chemicals coming together. Okay, So you can see I've gotten this Google Sites this time. I kind of moved over to this, trying it on out. Um, if you're able to come visit, obviously I got some good videos that I have borrowed from YouTube uh, with the people listed there um, for who has it. But here we go. On this unit, we are going to cover the signs of a chemical reaction, balancing chemical reactions, identifying types of reaction, predicting products, net ionic equations, and redox reactions. So it does look like a lot, but we kind of take each part piece by piece and kind of just add one more thing to the chemical reaction each time, or how we're kind of breaking it down when we get to predicting net ionic and redox reactions, okay? But again, for today, we're just looking at the signs of a chemical reaction and balancing chemical reactions, all right? Yep, that's it. So, signs of a chemical reaction, all right? I got some neat videos again here, but kind of hammering out the main signs of a chemical reaction, you got color change, okay? When you mix two chemicals together, we, we've talked about this before, kind of taking a moment to step back. Back in unit one, when we were just introducing matter, we had the idea of a chemical change is when the substances are turning into something brand new. Okay, And so that's the same idea. Chemical reaction and the chemical change are the same thing. So we've talked about these, but now we're going to get more into it a little bit and hopefully see them a bit more. But signs of a chemical reaction, color change is probably the most obvious one. Okay, to us, I guess, that, you know, every day to day type of thing. If something is changing color or, or has changed color, there must have been some chemical reaction occurring, whether we could see it or not. Again, that goes with mold, that goes with um, things rotting, rusting, things like that. That's color changes. Gas formation is another very popular one in the lab. This is, again, where we're not boiling the object. But when I mix those two things together, all of a sudden, gas bubbles form, okay? The best examples are, you know, if you've ever made volcanoes from vinegar and um, baking soda, okay? You're not boiling anything. Actually, the substance, the, the solution will get colder when you put those two things together, but it creates a gas coming out of it, which wasn't there before. A big one that we will use quite a bit and be talking about a lot in terms of solubility rules and figuring out what's going to be seen in the reaction all right because sometimes we don't actually see the reaction like i guess we still always see the reaction but you not, might not see a substance created in some way but we got to get used to this word precipitate precipitate and a precipitate is when a solid forms from mixing liquids or and or gases okay basically a solid is forming that's called a precipitate all right. So again, if you watch some of these videos, you'll see them mix two liquid solutions together. Okay. So there's a chemical dissolved in water, but then when you mix those two, all of a sudden a powder or solid will form. And again, a lot of times these things go together. Um, if you watch this last video over here, this will show you basically a color change and a precipitate forming. All right. It's a very common one. Potassium iodide and lead nitrate is going to form lead iodide, which is a yellowish solid that forms there. Okay, So that's what we're looking at uh, quite a bit with these types of uh, situations as well. All right. Um, I mean, there are, there are additional ones. Smell change, obviously, would be one. But the last one we're really kind of looking at, and we'll, talk, we'll do a whole other unit on this, is change in energy. All right. And so again, a very popular one where you can see Science Bob do this with Jimmy Kimmel um, is the barking dog reaction. It's a pretty neat one, all right? But it's a very high energy reaction where it'll create light and like seeing light emission, that would be another sign of a chemical reaction like glow sticks, okay? But also forming smoke, that's a gas formation, that's a chemical reaction occurring. But when we have these changes in energy occur, it's because we're breaking and reforming the chemical bonds. All right, And so that energy is released. And so we have two types of energy type reactions. We have what are called endothermic reactions. 
And again, I'm pretty sure we covered this back in chemical change, or at least mentioned it briefly. But an endothermic reaction is a reaction where the reaction will pull energy into itself. It needs energy from the environment, and it pulls it into, inside the atoms themselves to help create the reaction. Okay? And where this might be kind of confusing is where we pull this energy in, we're actually going to feel colder. All right, because the idea is it's pulling energy from you. It's pulling energy from the surroundings. And so everything around it, and it's going internally into it, so it's not producing heat, the object actually feels colder afterwards. So endo, endo into, okay? Endo goes inside, so it makes something that's colder. The opposite of that is exothermic reactions, and that's where you release, the reaction will release energy. And again, I feel like people more think about this one, but anytime you've done a cold pack, if you've ever had an injury and had to get a cold pack and you grabbed one of those things and kind of slap it and break, it basically it breaks a seal inside and things mix inside of it and it gets colder, that's an endothermic reaction. Again, exothermic reactions are the ones that maybe people think are more interesting because they're more explosive, because you're clearly seeing that energy get released. All right? But that's where everything will get warmer around it because it's coming from inside the reaction outwards. And so you feel that as heat. Okay? We will definitely do a lab later on where you're going to be identifying, you'll, you'll recognize that a chemical reaction took place based on these signs that you see here. Okay? Next, let's look at balancing. All right. So, Obviously, one of the big things with chemical reactions is writing and balancing chemical reactions, okay? Is writing these out in a form where we can then clearly see what are the two different or multiple compounds or elements doing, all right? But then we also have to balance it. So why do we balance chemical reactions? We balance chemical reactions because of the conservation of mass, all right? Mass cannot be created or destroyed, it's only converted to other forms. So in other words, it could be changed into energy in some ways. That's Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. Okay? But we have to, in our case, we're always going to try to account for every single gram, every single bit of mass that's in the reaction. We must have the same mass before the reaction and the same mass after the reaction, even if the atoms rearrange themselves. But this is why we then balance it, okay? We must account for all of those atoms by mass before and after the reaction, all right? We have to see that we have this conservation of mass. So in other words, kind of very briefly, if we have a reaction, and we're going to see these terms below, it's always reactants to products. If you use... 10 grams of reactants, we should form 10 grams of products. That's what should happen, again. I mean, in a way, we are using all 10 grams, and we should see all of it produced. In real life, in real practice, we will see that we might not get all of that mass to completely convert, if we, because again, some of it could be used to create energy, so we can have this loss of mass. Or the reaction might not go to completion, so you might be going, wait a minute, why am I not getting a full 10 grams out? Because maybe all of it didn't initially all react, so it's still there. Okay? But we should have a total mass on both sides that is equal. That's what we're sticking with. Okay? Um, we have different parts of the chemical reaction. We have, and you just saw me write it up there, we have reactants. These are the things that are our starting pro products, as the name implies, what's going to react. The yield arrow, that's the little arrow that's drawn in the middle. Okay? For now, basically we are always drawing it from the left to the right okay? at this point. We will learn later on when we start looking at equilibrium reactions so that we can have the products go back and create reactants where there's this balance between reactants and product side. But for now, the yield arrow, which is just that arrow, yep, we call it yield, meaning the progress arrow, what's being made, okay, yield means to make, and then the products are on the right. We never, ever 
break that rule. Reactants on the left, products on the right, and we're going to, for now, always have that arrow in between. Now, again, if you had physical science, you probably saw a lot of this too. One of the big things that in honors chem we're pushing a lot more is we want to include the state of matter if it is provided in the problem. Okay? Um, sometimes it might not be, and I'll let you know and be like, no, you don't need to know it. There's some cases where we might actually have to figure out the state of it, whether it's a solution or whether it's a solid or a gas or a liquid or so forth. Okay? For now, though, let's start off with the fact that we will give it to you in the written description of the reaction, and we have to include whether each compound is solid, liquid, gas, or what's called aqueous solution. Aqueous solution just means it's dissolved in water. Okay, dissolved in water is what we're looking at there. All right. So the whole point of that is then I can look at the reaction and I can imagine what's happening. I can sit there and be like, oh, you got two solutions and you mix them together. One of the compounds still remains in solution, but then there's the solid that appears, a precipitate appears. Okay? So that's what we're looking at and why we're writing out the states of matter. We write these states of matter just as a little tiny, um, a little tiny letter after the compound and just put it in parentheses. All right? So that's what we're looking at there. I guess I'll just mention it. Two other things that will be written in a chemical reaction will be the subscripts. This is for obviously telling you the number, uh, tells the number of atoms in a compound. So that's nothing new. We already know those uh, in compound. Okay. But we will start writing what are called coefficients. All right. And so these are numbers that are going to tell you, uh, a number tells you how many compounds are involved. So this is a number that's going to go in front of the compound or the element and say how many of those compounds elements are involved in the reaction. That's how we're going to balance it, is with the coefficients. All right, so that leads us to what are we going to write? We got what are called word equations, skeleton equations, and chemical equations. And you can see that I wrote coefficients down there. <laughs> All right, word equations. This is pretty simple. All you do is rewrite the, the written word problem and you write out what are the reactants and what are the products. You write out the reaction in words. You do still include the states of matter as just little, you know, S, L, G, and A, Q, just uh, abbreviations. But you write out the full chemical name, okay? We will be doing those some. Skeleton equations, that's where we, we change those names into the chemical formulas, where you write out, instead of carbon dioxide, you write CO2. Instead of sodium hydroxide, you write NaOH. All right? But a skeleton equation is an unbalanced chemical equation. And so that leads us finally to what's a chemical equation. Okay? A chemical equation is where we actually have it fully balanced. It's a balanced skeleton equation. So these two basically go together. I usually am not going to make you write the skeleton equation and chemical equation because if you write the chemical equation, the skeleton equation is inside that, and then you balance it, okay? And then, like I said, there's the definition for coefficients again, okay? It tells you the number of compounds or molecules present, all right? So that's going to lead us already to our practicing. So let's try some of these problems on out here, okay? I'm going to change my view here okay. so we can look at these. So jumping into some of these, let's write a word equation, and let's try to balance it. Okay, so word equations, nothing too big. You got solid ammonium dichromate yields products nitrogen gas, solid chromium oxide, chromium three oxide, and water vapor. So, what I'd write here is I'd write for the word equation, if I use my pen, ammonium dichromate. Word equations take a while. And it's a solid, it says, so I'm going to write S after it. It yields, so that's telling you, that's my only reactant. It's gonna yield or produce nitrogen gas. So nitrogen, so this is where knowing how to write compounds is gonna be big. Nitrogen is a diatomic molecule. So it will never just be nit N by itself. It's N2, and then it's a gas. Oops, I'm getting too ahead of myself, sorry. We were just write nitrogen, I'm doing the word equation. Nitrogen gas. 
plus, and again, you try to keep writing it out, but I just don't have space, solid chromium 3 oxide, so chromium 3 oxide, solid, plus water vapor. So water and vapor means gas. It would say liquid water if it's liquid water. So there is my overall word equation. All right, and I wish I had more space, so I guess wrote it a little smaller because I'm going to try to use this to try to show you what we're doing here. Okay, so that's done. Word equations, pretty straightforward. You just got to again go which side is which. Again, now we can point out that the left side, these are my reactants. I only have one ammonium dichromate. And all three of these things are my product. Nitrogen, gas, chromium, three oxide, and water. Okay? All right. So now let's write the skeleton equation. All right? So this is now practicing and showing off, can you write your compounds correctly? Do you know your polyatomic ions? So if we do this like we've done before, ammonium, ammonium dichromate. This is an ionic compound. I will say the majority of compounds you will do are going to be ionic based, all right? The majority of them will. We do have some covalent compounds. We clearly see that on the right-hand side. But most of the time, we're going to be using the ionic method of figuring out the formulas. So ammonium is plus 1. Dichromate is minus 2, okay? Minus 2. Then I have to write it. So in the end, I got NH4. Let me write this a little lower so I got to get those chemicals. NH4 and Cr2O7. So this would be NH42, Cr2O7. That is my reactant. And again, I crisscross the charges, okay, or balance the charges. It will yield, I was trying to do this before, nitrogen. Well, nitrogen is a diatomic, so we need to know our diatomics really well right now. So if I have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, or a hydrogen, it's always the element two, okay? plus chromium 3 oxide. Chromium is plus 3, oxide is minus 2, so crisscross that. So that'll be Cr2O3, and then water, H2O. Okay? We should write the symbol after it. I am going to balance, so I'm going to probably need a little bit more space here. Solid and gas. Okay? All right, so let's see if we can try to balance this out. All right, I'm going to show two methods with trying to balance this, I might show my second method on a second problem where it does, it's maybe a little bit more simple to see it, but it would be the same idea. My primary method, which again might be a little tough for those really new to it, is just staying organized and going back and forth with one element at a time. Now I do have some little tricks along the way. And one of them being, if an element is by itself, try to balance that one last. Okay, in the end. Try to balance that one last because if it's by itself, it's not going to affect any other elements when you try to add a coefficient in front of it. So I'll try to follow that on this one. N2, while it's two Ns, N is by itself. Again, what I mean is if I add a coefficient in front of N2, I'm only changing the number of nitrogens. If I change the coefficient in front of chromium 3 oxide, I'm going to change the number of chromium and oxygen atoms in that compound. Okay. So let's see how this works out. And again, sometimes these look a little more intimidating than they are if we just take our time through it. It's amazing how these just all of a sudden work. So I'm going to skip N, like I said, because it is at the beginning. That is, you don't have to follow that rule, but that is something I kind of follow when I do balancing. So how many hydrogens do I have? I'm going to start off with hydrogen. Well, I have four, four right here in ammonium, but I have two ammoniums, which means I have eight hydrogens which means I need eight hydrogens on the other side. Well, the only compound that has hydrogen in it is H2O. There might be multiple sources of hydrogen, and we can look at that. We might have to play around with it. But I only have one, fortunately, and H2O has two hydrogens. So anytime I increase the number of waters I have, I'm going to double the number of hydrogens. Okay? Because if I add another water in this, if I kind of say it that way, I now have two waters but there's four hydrogens total. So anytime I add a coefficient, it's going to be multiplied by two for hydrogen. So if I need eight and I have two here, what times two is eight? Four. So now I'm saying I have four waters. Okay. Sorry, four waters, true. And I have eight hydrogens. 
So hydrogen is now balanced on both sides, but I might have to come back to it. Even though it's balanced now, it might not be balanced later. Let's go to chromium now. Chromium I have two, chromium I have two. I don't need to do anything, it's already balanced. Oxygen, I have seven. I, need to, I have two sources of oxygen, so I need to add those up. So I have three from this one, and I have four waters, which means I have four oxygens from the other one. So guess what? I have seven. Oxygen's already balanced. Awesome. So all I have left to do is go back and look at nitrogen. There's, two, there's one nitrogen for every ammonium, but I have two ammoniums, so two times one is two nitrogens. And I have two nitrogens over there. And there's my balanced reaction. I know I have a lot of little extra arrows there, but the only thing I needed to add to balance this is a four in front of H2O. Okay? One thing we don't do is we never, add, we never put a coefficient of one. We don't do that. If we have written the chemical there, we know we have one there. All right? But that's it. So let's do another one. See if I have, see one that's a little bit easier to kind of go through. We could do this one. This one's not that big. Okay. So I'm only going to do one more word equation because they're pretty straightforward. Carbon tetrahydride gas and oxygen gas yield carbon dioxide and water. Okay. Now it probably should say carbon dioxide gas. It's going to be a gas. It's not going to be a liquid or a solid. But so we're going to make that assumption. Okay. So the word equation would be carbon tetrahydride. gas plus oxygen gas produces carbon dioxide gas plus water gas now we don't say water vapor like that's not the, the chemical name for water is not water vapor we just write water okay so here's a perfect example where it's not ionic nothing in this is ionic so these are all covalent compounds but hopefully they're ones that we know but that is my word equation. My skeleton equation now, I write out the formulas. Carbon tetrahydride means CH4. Okay, I'm going to put a little line in front of it now to try to say that's where we're going to put our coefficient. Uh, gas plus line. Oxygen. Oxygen is a diatomic, so this is O2. Gas produces CO2 gas plus H2O gas. Okay. So here we go. So now this one, I'll try to show it. And again, we've done an activity, if you're in my class, where we can actually visualize when we change the coefficients, how many compounds come out. All right. So if I look at this, I have one carbon on this side. I have four hydrogens. And I have two oxygens. I'm going to write this like this, two oxygens. All right. I'm going to put a line out of that so you don't think it's 20. On this side, I have one carbon. Uh, with two oxygens, and I have two hydrogens and one oxygen. So I have a total of three oxygens on this side. Now there's a reason I'm writing them together instead of just listing all of the atoms. The reason I'm writing them together is these two elements are together. So I cannot change the number of carbons without changing the number of hydrogens. If I put a 2 in front of CH4, I'm multiplying both of these by 2. So that's why I'm saying that they're connected. Sometimes people make a mistake there and, are, and kind of screw that up in terms of going, well, I only needed one more carbon, but I wanted to keep the hydrogens the same. You can't do that. Okay? So same thing on the other side. What, this one carbon and oxygen are connected. These two hydrogens and that one oxygen is connected. All right. Now, this is another one that I do have, quote, unquote, a trick for some. Okay? And I don't think it's going to show up on this particular equation. But this is a good one where we want to leave oxygen balanced alone. Like, leave that one last to balance. Balance everything else other than oxygen. Okay? So if I go through this, I have one carbon, I have one carbon. So I don't need to do anything with that yet. I have four hydrogens on the reactant side, two hydrogens on the product side. So I need to increase this to four. But I can only increase this each time by twos. It's H2O. So if I put a two over here, that gets me to four hydrogens now. But it also increases my oxygens two more. So now I have or up to two oxygens off of that compound. Okay. So now I do have four hydrogens, four hydrogens. They're balanced. Did it mess up carbon? Double check. No, it didn't mess up carbon because there's no carbon in H2O. So carbon is still balanced. Hydrogen is balanced. All I have left is oxygen. 
Well, I got to make sure to count all the sources of oxygen on the product side. There's two from CO2, and there's now two from H2O because there's two waters. So there's a total of four oxygens. Well, this one's nice and easy. I, that means I can just multiply this by two. That's a coefficient of two, and we're balanced with four oxygens. Okay. And there you go. There's another one right there. All right. So I want to show you my trick that could come up. And this pretty much always works. I haven't run into any issues so much. It sometimes gets a little crazy, but it usually works. But this is not this reaction. What if I had instead C2H6 plus O2 yield CO2 plus H2O? Well, you're definitely going to see this one again. Okay. So in this one, I'm going to go my little bit of faster method. Okay. I have two carbons. I only have one carbon, so I need to put a two right there. Okay, so now my carbons are balanced. Okay, let's look at um, hydrogen. Hydrogen, I have six. I have two over here. I need to multiply it by three, and I'll have six. The thing is, this is what I mean that's going to happen with this type of reaction. You're going to learn this is called a combustion reaction, and this happens a lot with combustion. When I get to the right-hand side and count up my oxygens, I have four O's from the carbon dioxide, and I have three O's from the water, which means I have a total of seven oxygens. If you look at this, can I ever get seven oxygens on the other side? No, 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 no. You cannot have half coefficients or decimal coefficients. Coefficients are whole numbers. Okay? So, how can I get seven on this side? Like I can't, the, the only number I could put is 3.5, which is not allowed. So what you do is if you run into this situation, and this works in other situations too, where you, like it doesn't have to just be a combustion, but if you run into it where you're like, I have an odd number and I cannot get an odd number on the other side in some way, my suggestion is, and this is just like a little trick, and I mean, there's no textbook that necessarily says to do this, is, Start the whole reaction over. So get rid of all the coefficients that you have. Some people would say keep going with it. That's fine. You can totally keep going and try to figure it out. I mean, it's not a huge trick. But I say erase everything and put a 2 in front of the C2H6 compound. This is going to be called a hydrocarbon. I'm showing this now because we're going to get to types of reactions in the next video, and we're going to say this is called a hydrocarbon. But you put that 2 in front of the hydrocarbon, the carbon-hydrogen compound. Now go back and rebalance, and you usually will get a correct balancing now. So now we have four carbons, so I need four over here, so that's a four. I have 12 hydrogens, so this is going to become a six. Six times two is 12. Now I have eight oxygens here and six oxygens here for a total of 14 oxygens. Well, 14 can be divided by two, so that's seven. There you go. Now it's balanced. All right. Now one of the things I guess I'm trying to, I, I did not mention with this, and I should have said when we balance chemical reactions, is we want to make sure you have the lowest ratio of all the coefficients. And so if you have the lowest ratio, then you have the correct answer. So if I look at all these numbers, while 2, 4, and 6 can all be divided by 2, 7 cannot. All right. It'll become a decimal. So that is one thing we want to double check at the end is, can you divide all the coefficients by two, maybe three? I'd be surprised if you're going to get any higher than that. Okay. If this happened not to work, if you did that, if you did double and you found that it still did not balance, you still had an odd number on one side, what I actually tell you to do again is go back and start over and double this again, go up to four. And what you'll run into is it should work out. If you end up doubling too much, what you'll find out is you got to reduce everything. You're like you'll get it balanced, and you'll go, wait, everything can be divided by two. Go ahead and do that. Okay. So maybe one more. Okay. All right. So I'm not going to do the word equation. The word equation would be mercury two oxide solid produces yield arrow mercury L and O2 gas or oxygen gas. So if I want to write this one on out, mercury is plus 2, oxide is minus 2. So that one's just going to be HGO, and that's solid. Produces mercury, that's just by itself. Is mercury diatomic? Nope. So it's just HG, 
And then O is oxygen diatomic. Yes, gas. All right. If I look at this one, HG and HD are balanced. O, O2 is not balanced. I need to put a 2 in front of HGO. That now unbalances HG, so I come back and put a 2 right there, and that's it. Okay. Not every single chemical reaction is going to be that difficult. There are going to be ones that I give you where if you write it out correctly, everything's already balanced. It's 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay. And again, this is the lowest ratio because technically there's a 1 right here. Okay but we don't write it, and you can't go any lower than that. All right? So that's basically it for balancing chemical reactions. All right, so time to practice and practice and practice.